Okay. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Denver. Welcome to Lower Downtown. I'm so happy that you are all here. My name is Judy Montero, and I am the council representative for this area. And you are in the heart of Council District 9, Lower Downtown in Denver, Colorado. And before we get the program started, I wanted to go ahead and thank the Alliance Center, John Powers, thank the Daily Cost and Progress Now for being sponsors in this wonderful event. And I gotta tell you, I'm so excited because um, within our council district, we have lots of young progressive people who actually uh, help maintain my council blog every day. So I'm hoping that we can link to, um, to bigtent.org so that we can continue to get all this information. Today on our schedule, we have uh, the um, workshop called Reducing Demand Green for All. And we have Van Jones, who is here. I saw Van, but I don't see him now. He'll be coming to the curtains shortly. Hi, Van. Nice entrance, by the way. OK. Who is a founder and president of Green for All. And then I also am really excited to introduce Dave McCurdy, who is president and CEO of the Alliance of Automobile Manufacturers. And again, they're here today, and they are going to talk about reducing demand green for all. So who wants to go first? OK, come on up. Oh, you're going to sit down. That, that looks pretty relaxed. OK, great. OK. For the camera? So I don't want to get double uh, feedback here. Okay. Uh, hi, I'm Dave McCurdy, and uh, it's a pleasure uh, this morning to join my uh, friend uh, Van Jones. Uh, Van and I, uh, this is the first time we've seen each other uh, kind of dressed like this. You know, as Democrats, uh, we're not used to being quite so corporate here, but uh, Van and I spent uh, a week, actually eight days uh, together in the high Arctic, uh, about 400 miles from the North Pole. Uh, with a group uh, with the Aspen Institute and National Geographic and uh, it was a marvelous experience and uh, we both came away with a renewed uh, uh, commitment to uh, continue to promote uh, solutions for reducing uh, CO2 and addressing uh, climate change and global warming and uh, I'll introduce Van uh, a bit give him a mic but I would tell you having spent time with Van uh, I had to grab the mic first because once he gets the mic, it is over. And I know when, uh, you know, I, I, I spent a little bit of a career in the, in the Congress and in the Democratic Party, but I've learned in, in my experience to uh, never uh, uh, follow someone like Van. I had to do that <clears throat> in a, on a panel in a, on a ship, and uh, it was probably one of the loneliest uh, times of my uh, career. I told him the, uh, the, the equivalent of that was when I actually second the nomination of Bill Clinton in 1992 uh, at the National Convention in, in New York City. Uh, and I thought it was a rather good speech. Unfortunately, I had to follow Mario Cuomo. And by the time I was on speaking, they had already tuned off uh, my segment and were doing the post speech analysis, you know, with all the national networks. Uh, so I, uh, I'm going to introduce Van in just a second, but we, we are here together to talk about reducing demand. And I was in Denver last Monday, uh, and we launched a new program called Eco Driving USA. And the banner over here on the on the left uh, on the wall here is uh, so www.ecodrivingusa.com. And in that announcement. Uh, our friend, Governor Bill Ritter from Colorado, and uh, Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger from California uh, were the two governors and the lead governors to launch this event that's sponsored by the Alliance of Automobile Manufacturers. Uh, the whole purpose of Eco Driving USA is an education consumer initiative, a consumer awareness program to provide uh, instructive uh, and, and helpful tips to not only save money at the pump for consumers, but 
to reduce uh, fuel usage, uh, oil and gas, and at the same time uh, reduce CO2 because they are, as you know, directly uh, equivalent. And uh, this launch uh, was a huge success, and we're going to do it uh, across the country. And we started with governors because we believe there is such a key role for states and local communities in trying to provide leadership in working with consumers to address these big problems. Uh, and uh, if you go to this website, it's a cool website. Uh, when you actually log on, you'll see uh, the governor, as I would uh, affectionately refer to Arnold Schwarzenegger, uh, uh, actually come on the screen and introduce the website. Uh, and as you know, there's very few that are as uh, aggressive or as committed as, as he as to trying to find solutions to reduce uh, global warming. Uh, and Governor Schwarzenegger uh, is committed in working with us because there are three kind of legs of the stool uh, to address this problem. One is the technology that we as manufacturers uh, are committed to uh, providing. And that's whether there's uh, alternative fuel vehicles, whether it's hybrids, uh, plug-ins, uh, ultra-clean diesel, all these new technologies that, uh, that you see uh, and that will be coming uh, uh, pretty quickly, uh, especially now when you kind of hit that magic $4 gasoline. It's amazing what the market has done to shift. Uh, the other are fuels uh, and the need to move away from just uh, petroleum use as the primary fuel for transportation. And third is consumer. And sometimes we forget about the role of the consumer. Eco-driving has worked in Europe, and there's real-world experience in uh, this effort. And it's more than just saying, well, you need to inflate your tires properly, which actually does contribute to improved uh, mileage. Uh, but it also, you know, common tips like making sure that your vehicle is maintained properly, uh, proper oil, uh, air filters, et cetera. Uh, the National Association, Automobile Dealers Association has joined us and are actually offering a free green checkup uh, for the month of September uh, in Colorado and other states so that people have an opportunity to actually go in and, and make sure. We did a, uh, an event on Capitol Hill in the Rayburn House office building, a place I used to park in uh, on a regular basis, and we were just doing free uh, tire checks uh, for members of Congress and staff as they came out of the building. <laughs> we found that the average, and it's hard to believe that anyone in Congress would be underinflated, but we actually found that the average car uh, tire of a member of Congress was six PSI, pounds per square inch, lower than the recommended level. And they were wasting for each uh, uh, one PSI, it's about, or two, it's, it's about 2% uh, uh, reduction in uh, your actual uh, fuel efficiency. So uh, it is something simple, and, and, and uh, Senator Obama has uh, clearly uh, identified that as well. But it goes beyond that. Uh, there's also beyond maintenance tips and common sense tips about how you actually improve the efficiency of your vehicle uh, using air conditioning once you get above 40 miles uh, per hour. Uh, removing excess, uh, you know, weight from the vehicle. Uh, I usually use my wife as a foil, but she uh, she doesn't object. She drives a hybrid, but if she keeps a lot of weight in the back, it uh, undercuts all of the advantage that she's getting by using an alternative uh, fuel vehicle. Uh, and so it's also how you drive. And driving is an important part of it. Those of us who grew up, I grew up in Oklahoma and similar to Colorado, big wide open spaces and uh, probably used to, to driving with a little heavier foot than maybe van would in Oakland. But uh, it, um, uh, you know, jackrabbit starts uh, cost you dearly and it actually can translate into uh, costs at the pump, uh, but also, uh, you know, certainly affects your fuel efficiency. Being able to time lights, being able to to uh, some people call it hypermiling now, but uh, eco driving in Europe, the average savings was between 15 and 20 percent. And what does that mean? That's a billion gallons of gasoline. When 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 gasoline hit four dollars, uh, we saw over the last six month period over a billion over a billion miles traveled, vehicle miles traveled less than the previous year, less than the previous year because of the market price. So 
people are more conscious of it, and we need to build on that and continue to, to use that uh, as initiative. But if you go to this website, uh, uh, we're la we, we launched it uh, here in Denver, but the um, other states, other governors are already signing up. There's a role they can play. We're working with the uh, Demar Department of Motor Vehicles. We're working with the uh, association that works, uh, supports the um, driver's education teachers. Uh, we're working with other groups to try to get them to not only link into the website, but also to take these common uh, sense tips. And uh, there's a calculator in there. You can actually put the, your, your actual type of vehicle, miles, and, and how you travel. Uh, there's a virtual game. We all like games uh, in, in this uh, virtual world. Uh, and you can actually test. Uh, there are professional trainers in eco-driving that have worked with our staff and working with others that uh, kind of embarrass you pretty quickly and to realize how you think you might be driving smartly, but you can actually improve your performance uh, dramatically. So this is a good effort, uh, something that we think is responsible, and uh, we look forward to working with uh, all the different groups. Uh, you'll see us throughout the uh, convention but uh, please uh, take advantage of it and uh, log on to the website. Um, and uh, that's my intro. And then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask Van to have the same length of time as I did. No, it, uh, and then the world, after Van uh, talks about uh, uh, Green Jobs and what he's doing and the remarkable leadership effort that uh, he's brought to this, uh, we can talk about other issues and we'll have a conversation. And since we're both shy and retiring people, I'm sure it will be rather dull and we'll finish early, but uh, if not, uh, I think it should be uh, fun and entertaining. So Van Jones, who's uh, not only incredibly bright, well-educated, uh, you, you're a Yaley, right? Yeah, you're a Yaley. It, uh, but uh, uh, I'm a Sooner, so I, I tease him. But uh, Van is uh, in Oakland, and he's uh, started this program. He's been a community uh, organizer as well, uh, and uh, I think he probably needs no introduction to this group because uh, I think he was a big hit the, the couple days after you got back from the Arctic you went to was it Dallas uh, Austin uh, and spoke to the uh, the symbol group there and I know I saw I, I watched it and uh, he's truly a dynamic speaker and a great leader my friend Van Jones thank you hey. well, first of all I'm glad to be here with Dave uh, the last time we were, I was with him, uh, there were two good things and one bad thing. The bad thing was we were on a boat in the Arctic, and I managed to smash my head open, uh, uh, not because I was defending Jimmy Carter from polar bears or anything like that. I just slipped. and Anyway, so that was a bad thing. The good thing was uh, we did get a chance to see firsthand uh, that everything Al Gore is talking about is true and, and worse, uh, and we need to act. Uh, the other good thing was uh, we got a chance to see both walruses and polar bears, and I'm happy to report that most of you have the, 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 the benefit of being able to see walruses without smelling them. Uh, it would be very hard to defend that species if they had scratch and sniff pictures uh, in National Geographic and stuff like that. So just be glad you've just seen their beauty and you haven't smelled their booty. So having said that, um, I also want to say uh, how much I learned uh, from Dave. There are very few uh, Democrats that have the kind of wingspan that Dave has, uh, being completely trusted by uh, the Democratic caucus and also being able to be such a, a strong and principled champion of the real needs of the automobile industry as it makes its transition. Uh, uh, the, it's, it's, we've uh, been very good at demonizing uh, the automakers and uh, saying what they ought to do and uh, Dave has been able to explain to people on our side the actual math involved, the numbers involved of trying to get our automakers to make this transition and be competitive and, and, and keep providing jobs for people. That was a very uh, important role that he played in helping us all get a little bit more compassionate for each other as we try to walk through this transition together. Uh, and this is a time of transition. Uh, we are at the end of the age of oil and we are at the beginning of the solar age. Uh, and our task is to get from one age to a new age uh, with minimum pain and maximum gain for the children of all species, uh, including our own children. And uh, a part of this transition is also what I call the age 
of Obama. Uh, you know, many of us are here uh, recognizing that something new is happening in politics. And there has been a concentrated effort this summer to get into our heads and to make us ashamed to have hope, to make it almost that being hopeful and, and positive and optimistic, oh, that was last season's fad. You know, that, that's so last week, y'all. You know, now we got to be cynical. That's, that's, that's the cool thing. You don't, you don't want to be a part of the celebrity cult of Obama. Oh, no, no, no. Be cynical. Be realistic. Uh, keep your dreams small. Uh, and I think the, the, the biggest defeat, no matter what happens in November, the biggest defeat for us would be if we stop having high hopes for this country, if we stop believing that change is possible, if we stopped imagining a politics we could reach across lines of class and color and ideology. Um, that is the great gift of this campaign. And that's what we're trying to take from us. If we win in November but lose that, we haven't won anything at all. And if we lose in November but keep that, we can still change the country. So it's very important that we, uh, uh, as another a great leader once said, keep our hope alive. And part of the hope that I have is because of the work that you're doing, Dave, because of the work that people like the Alliance for Sustainable uh, Colorado are doing and others, to begin to green this country. Um, let me say one thing about this process. At this stage in the transition, from the oil-based economy to renewable economy, it's all Adam Smith. We haven't gotten anything radical. We haven't gotten anything crazy. I mean, at some point, we're going to have to get to a place where we recognize that growth, economic growth, in a quantitative sense, has to come to an end. And it has to become now a qualitative sense of who we are as people, how we live our lives. Uh, but we haven't even talked, we're not even talking about that. We're talking about just trying to uh, get our growth trajectory on something a little bit more sustainable. And because of that, uh, I think we should be uh, very loud and proud that we have some important answers for the country on three things. Number one, energy price. We're all friends here. Let's talk about the fact that there are people who have been whooping us all summer on the energy price question and using people's legitimate economic fears to drive people in the direction of climate destroying solutions, seeking tiny short-term gains in exchange for a long-term devastating pain for the whole planet. You know what I'm talking about. Let's go drill our way out of this. We can drill and burn our way out of this. We're just going to throw away America's beauty. We're going to abandon our coastline communities. Let's remember, we didn't stop uh, coastal drilling because we were concerned about the duckies and the fishies. Let's remember that. I mean, as important as the duckies and the fishies are, that wasn't the reason. It was because the health and the safety of all those coastline families was being jeopardized every day. It's because the beauty of those beaches every day was being despoiled. People remember going down to Santa Barbara, and you, when you would go out, you get out of the water, you would have oil all on your feet, and you have to use gas to get all. People remember that in California. Uh, that wasn't because of an oil slick. That was the daily operation. So the idea that you're going to throw all of our coastline communities, the health and safety of those children, under the bus, seeking uh, the last drop of oil, feeding our oil addiction. But that's smart policy. That's the best we can do as Americans. Uh, that is now polling well. Because again, people haven't heard that there's a green solution for energy prices. Uh, the work that Dave is doing. You know, again, we can stay with Adam Smith. We don't have to do anything radical here. How do you get prices down? One side says drill and burn your way out. If you do that, you bake the planet. You throw away America's beauty. You have our country scraping the bottom of the barrel for the nastiest polycar uh, polycarbons, tar sands, oil shale, liquefied coal. Uh, you have us acting like crackheads for carbon. You know, that's, the, that's the, the solution. But there's another answer. And the other answer is, how do you get prices down? Adam Smith. Cut demand, diversify supply. Simple as that. Cut demand, diversify supply, and create jobs. When the other side says, drill here, drill now, pay less, we should say, cut demand, expand supply, and create jobs. We have an answer. And how do you cut the demand? You cut demand 
by doing the things that Dave just talked about, making sure that people are driving well, driving smart, you go beyond that. Weatherizing millions of homes so they don't leak so much energy begins to cut their energy costs down, saves them money. Grandmama right now is worried. Why? Because how is she going to pay the energy bill in the wintertime when the energy prices go up? If we had a crash program in this country to weatherize millions of homes, starting with the low-income people first, right? We could keep grandmama warm in her home. We could put millions of people to work with green hard hats and tool belts and work boots on going around, double painting the glass, blowing in the insulation, uh, wrapping those uh, hot water heaters with blankets, all that good vocational green collar work so you can start bringing jobs back. A crash program for weatherization begins to cut demand for energy. It also begins to create jobs. Um, uh, we can go uh, crash course for mass uh, public transportation. And rail also creates jobs, begins to cut demand. Uh, these are practical, realistic answers that realize that the price of oil is going to continue to go up anyway. It may go up slow, it may go up fast. But you put people to work. That's how you cut demand. You cut demand by putting people to work. How do you expand the supply? Same principle. Many of you flew here. You're going to fly home. Look out your window. Every city you fly over, look at all those rooftops with no solar panels on them. Go to sleep, sleep for an hour, wake up, look out the window again, and you'll see even more rooftops. We need to have a crash program to solarize this country, to put solar panels on rooftops all across the country. Again, you create millions of green collar jobs, thousands of contracts for new entrepreneurs. You can improve the, the, the wealth and the work available to people. And guess what? You can start closing some of these dirty power plants and improve the health of communities. So you can take the asthma inhaler out of little girls' pockets and little boys' pockets all over this country with a massive solarization project. So our answer on price for energy is good for wealth, it's good for health, it's good for work, uh, it's good for the planet, it's good for the people, it's good for energy prices. We have an answer, and it's a green answer, and it's a good answer, and it's a comprehensive answer. And that's just Adam Smith. We haven't even gotten to the, to the real spiritual uh, dimensions of this. We're still just in basic economics. And so uh, uh, this is something I think is important for us to, to keep in mind. The last thing I want to say is this before we have a conversation. We have people all over this country who want to work and cannot find work. Don't let anybody tell you that you got a lot of people proud not to be working or proud to be a part of the underground economy. Uh, we have Reverend Michael Beckwith here from Los Angeles. He knows that the drug trade, yeah, y'all can clap, uh, we have a, a hero here, a spiritual and political hero here on the front row. He knows that the drug trade in, in Los Angeles, uh, the people are not making money in that anymore. People are, 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 are stressed. Uh, people are dying. Uh, but people don't see other options. We have genius locked up in our prisons. We have genius locked out of the economy in our rural communities on meth now. Uh, people talk about the homicide rate in urban America. They don't talk about the suicide rate in rural America, young white children who are suffering, who nobody is a champion for. Uh, we have brothers and sisters coming home from Iraq, from Afghanistan. Their spirits are broken. They need to have the gun taken out of their hand and have some tools put in their hand so they can begin to till the soil. Uh, they can begin to, 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 to help improve this country. We, we have people who need a mission. They don't just need a paycheck, they need a purpose. Well, what I would say is that the idea that we can retrofit a nation, that we can reboot, retrofit, and repower a nation, can provide these young people with both the paycheck and the purpose that they're lacking right now. We have all this work that needs to be done, and it's the most important work in the history of the world to turn the, the nation that is the number one source of pollution into the number one source of solutions. That's the most important work that needs to be done. And we have all these people who need work. Let's be wise enough as a people to connect those who most need work with the work that most needs to be done, fight pollution and poverty at the same time, end forever the need for oil wars and resource wars, and bring this country together. Thank you very much.
now you understand why I didn't give him the mic first. Uh, actually, uh, I, I told Ben when we were in the Arctic that uh, whenever he's ready to run for Congress, uh, you know, I'm, I'm ready to uh, write him a check as well. Or president or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Um, ben, when we were, uh, we worked together in the Arctic, we had a chance to um, talk with a range of really interesting uh, thought leaders and political leaders and activists. Uh, we had the, the uh, heads of most of the major environmental uh, groups uh, on board. We had former President Carter, Senator Daschle. Uh, we had uh, a number of Republican leaders, uh, Fred Malik, uh, Meg Whitman, who's a coach, C former CEO of eBay and uh, uh, a co-chair of the McCain campaign. We had CEOs from DuPont, Monsanto, and some of the other major uh, industries. And I thought what was uh, remarkable was not just the, uh, and I had actually had an opportunity that some had not. I had been to the South Pole and to the Antarctic. so. Uh, my wife's a psychiatrist, you say I was about as close to being bipolar as you could get by going to, to both poles. But, uh, you know, many of us obviously are, are aware of, of the challenge and, and are trying to find a solution. But I thought what was remarkable from it, and, and Van was very much involved in, in drafting the statement uh, that we all supported and uh, actually have posted on websites, and I actually have a video from the trip uh, in our lobby of, of the Alliance plane. Uh, but it was really interesting there because you, you, you put the poetry into the message, and you need that to, to make it work. But behind that uh, poetry was some, I think, some uh, common commitment to find solutions, and that it needed to be done on a non-ideological basis. It needed to be done on a non-partisan basis. It needs to be done by those who truly are uh, concerned about the environment, uh, future generations, and, and the legacy, uh, and God's nature. And so that was part of, part of our message there. Uh, I thought that we made progress, and I think the, the active statement, the active part of that statement was that after this election, up through the election, and obviously through the campaigns uh, after uh, this election, then there needs to be the convening of a stakeholders group to really sit down and get the right players together to address this and, and look across the economy, look across the spectrum, find those people that are most uh, involved. You know, we're part of the problem. We, we contribute 20% of the CO2 in the U.S. environment, uh, the auto industry, cars, that's both current cars on the road and, and, and future technologies. Uh, we're committed to reducing that. We, we supported the energy bill in Congress to, for a 40% increase in CAFE standards. That's a start. We want to continue to work on that. But uh, all of us have a responsibility. But since you were part of the draft, you were the drafter. As a matter of fact, I made my way down one o'clock. We were in pretty rough sea at one point, and I had this patch on because I don't like uh, that and so it's about two in the morning and I I make my way down and bouncing from one side of the corridor to the other as the ship rolled and rocked and uh, I knock on the door and Van's leaning against a bunk with a laptop on his uh, lap literally a laptop typing this out oblivious to the seas and the roll and all the rest uh, trying to find a consensus document that both Democrats Republicans business environmentalists activists climatologists experts could all sign on, and I thought you did a great job. So, Van, why don't you tell us a little bit about that statement? Well, it was um, it was a, a powerful experience for me. Um, first of all, I'm, I'm on this boat, um, and, you know, black people had bad experiences with boats. You know, that's, that's already, <laughs> you know, like, thinking about some ancestry there on the, this boat. So, um, uh, then I'm pitching around and stuff like that, and uh, managed to hit my head, and that wasn't too impressive. And then you have people like, hey, brother. I saw you sneaking. Hey, brother, good to see you. Um, uh, and then there's all these dignitaries on the boat. Uh, Jimmy Carter's on the boat, and Ted Turner, and you know, all these people. And uh, Tom Dasher was on the boat. And um, uh, you really get a chance to appreciate how much world-class leadership we have in the United States. You know, you had you know, Meg Whitman, who's there, uh, chairing uh, uh, McCain's 
I guess, finance committee. And then Dashiell is right there, and they're sitting across the table from each other. And you, you can't imagine a more civil, uh, concerned about the country conversation. I mean, I really wish, we have all this great media, both alternative and mainstream. I wish they could show, you know, away from the, 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 the crossfires and that kind of stuff, how deeply people really care. And when people are speaking from that place, how can we make this work? It was really beautiful. I just want to try and document some of it. Uh, that was my, I mean, it was, it was blowing me away to hear the conversation. I was just trying to find those, those resonant moments produced to paper. Um, I think that the uh, uh, most exciting thing for me was that there, nobody who got off that boat, having gone to the Arctic and seen it for themselves, and having had conversations, we had evangelicals and Planned Parenthood on the same boat, not one fight. You know, we had, you know, I mean, it was unbelievable because when you get that perspective of how imperiled we all are, something comes up in people. And there's a beauty in the American character, um, that, that determination, that, that, that problem-solving orientation. You know, sometimes it goes too far and we start, you know, destroying stuff to, to make cool gizmos. But there's something in that that's good. And we need a politics that will let that come up. And I saw the beginnings of that on this ship. Um, I also want to point out that nobody got off the boat, no matter who they were, thinking that we could drill and burn our way out. People understood we're going to have to invent and invest our way out. That's the only real pathway forward, is to invent and invest our way out. And I was just trying to add that one more I, include. Invent, invest, and include. Let's make this green wave lift all boats. Uh, let's not have communities get hit first and worst on everything negative from climate change, whether you're talking about the floods, the fires, Katrina, and then benefit last and least from everything positive in the green economy. Let's make sure the communities that were locked out of the pollution-based economy are locked into this clean and green economy. Let's build a green wave that can lift all boats. Um, but it was, a, it was a big, for somebody like myself, it was an incredible experience. As you can tell, Van, uh, it, it was a small ship. It was a little bit bigger than a boat, but it was certainly not a cruise. But uh, it was uh, was important. And some of the people on the uh, ship as well, uh, Larry Page is the founder of Google, and uh, a number of other people who are very involved in the in trying to, to go the next generation of, of electric generation to the so-called smart grid. And there was a lot of conversation about that. You know, the, beyond just the the initial discussions about uh, climate itself and, and, and warming and uh, other consequences with that. We also, what amazed me, having been the chairman of the Intelligence Committee in the Congress and Armed Services, to see how uh, there is a new potential international rivalry for uh, access to this part of the, the globe. and. You can't be there without <clears throat> really appreciating how um, tenuous it is and how uh, challenging the environment and how few species actually survive uh, there. I think that's something that was really uh, truly remarkable. But the Russians, uh, are, I think, because of both some of the recent actions and their <clears throat> drive to actually plant a metal flag at the uh, floor of the North Pole, uh, is uh, a, a significant challenge uh, globally, and there's, there are international implications. Uh, we started off the trip in Oslo, uh, where uh, Vice President Gore, who we sat next to each other, committees, two different committees. Uh, I knew him when he was Al, and then the Vice President, now the uh, the, the rock star uh, Al Gore. But uh, uh, he actually got the Nobel Prize. But the uh, head of uh, I think the the um, he wasn't the prime minister, but he was like deputy for uh, Norway, said that uh, there's not going to be a solution without American leadership. The world needs American leadership on this issue. Um, but you, you talked about inventing our way out. Uh, there's an incredible amount of technology being developed. Uh, I think what uh, we'd like to do is make sure that that investment is, uh, the, the, the value of that investment is maximized in this country and the increasing opportunities uh, for people uh, across all spectrums, color, race, uh, religion, whatever, uh, location, and there, there's opportunities in, in each of those areas. But it's going to take, a, I think, some national leadership to do that. Um, but having said that, if you, if you have a question, if not, I thought uh, we've got
few minutes, we'd take a couple of questions from the floor. This young lady here. repeat the question. Yeah. Right. It's a great question. Uh, the question is, and, and, and Van can talk about this because he's uh, engaged as well, but now living in Washington, dealing with the, the U.S. side of this and, and spending a lot of time in the states, uh, there are an initiatives at both the federal and the state level uh, in, in local communities can do it as well. Uh, the, the question is what, because of Germany's uh, leadership role in developing solar panels and actually having it deployed uh, throughout the country and the population, they provide significant tax incentives uh, to do that. Uh, and uh, these uh, credits and, and uh, you know, are market-based uh, as opposed to just mandates, uh, just saying you will do this. They actually provide economic incentives for people to um, to invest, and they're considerable investments yet. You know, and, the, and when you look at the development of technology, the first stage is technology is usually quite expensive. You're trying to get the return on, on the research and development. But the more they're deployed, then the costs generally decline. And you'll see that with solar. Uh, there were some technical hurdles, but they're, the capability is improving dramatically. We see the same thing in the, uh, the auto sector, batteries. The big, I use the tent metaphor here, and the big pole in the tent uh, in auto technology is battery technology. Uh, and to be able to move from a heavier, uh, whether it's uh, uh, you know traditional lead acid battery to the lithium ion battery, uh, big significant changes in weight and storage and power density. Uh, that problem has not been solved yet. Uh, and governments around the world are investing uh, tremendously in who's going to win that race on, on having that technological development. Uh, at the federal level, yes, the, the U.S. government is providing uh, the both uh, requirements for the utility industry to move to renewable fuels. Uh, I think if you flew into Denver, you saw the big solar panel at the airport. Uh, states are doing that. I know that uh, Governor Ritter is providing a lead on that front. Uh, the same is true with wind generation. I come from Oklahoma where you have both sun and wind. Um, and those are important uh, resources that we can use. So government does have a role. Uh, it's through incentives, somewhat through mandates, through uh, the more uh, concentrated use of energy such as utilities. Uh, and then I think eventually you'll see more and more credits uh, for the development of technology. Uh, R&D tax credits, those kinds of things that applied for solar and uh, wind generation, and other types. Larry Page from Google, he's big into geothermal. There, I think the important thing from my perspective, and I'll turn to Van, there is no silver bullet solution for any of this. And if you're waiting for the one solution to solve all the problems, forget it. It's, it, it takes the silver buckshot, I think someone used, maybe it was Meg Whitman used that term, uh, to, to really address this issue because it takes a lot of different solutions, some geographical, some more market-based, some more within the reach of other people, uh, you know, people with different incomes, uh, and also from an industry standpoint. But it takes leadership to do that. That's good. Well, the, the question was about, about solar and, and the government. Uh, I think you did a great job talking about, about policy and, and the technology piece. I just want to talk about the values piece and the spiritual piece on that. Um, from a values point of view, right now the government is on the side of the problem makers in the U.S. economy. If you look at where the government sends its money, uh, pays attention, sends loves, tax credits, supports, it's the problem makers in the economy. It's the polluters who get huge subsidies and support. It's the, the Pentagon, the warmongers. Uh, it's the incarcerators. The people who, at the end of the day, when they get finished spending their money, we're actually a little bit worse off rather than better off. The big shift that has to happen, the shift that has to happen, is we have to get our government to be on the side of the problem solvers in our economy. And the problem solvers in our economy are our eco-entrepreneurs, 
um, our solar entrepreneurs, our wind entrepreneurs, our artists, our teachers, you know, our, our people at the community level that take a penny and can do a miracle with a kid when an incarcerator could take $10 and make that kid into a felon by sticking him in a, in a cage and treat him like an animal. Ten bucks, uh, you know, in places like Cal in California, we spend $100,000 per kid per year locked up in the prison system. $120,000. And most of those kids come out and they're worse off. And they wind up basically going to adult prison. Uh, if I had $120,000 and one kid in a year, I mean, how, uh, coaching, counseling, we could go to Europe. We could buy the kid a hybrid. You know, you could tell the kid, look, here's $50,000. Stay out of trouble. And at the end of the year, I give you 50 more. Keep 40. I mean, there's no way to mess up that much money and still have kids in trouble unless you weren't trying to help them at all, okay? So right now the government is spending its money helping the problem makers. We have beautiful problem solvers. The whole political transition is simply, those are the values, spiritual part of it. We have turned our country into uh, a vulture culture. What do I mean by that? We live off death. Literally. What is oil? What is coal? All that is is a process of life. Fixing carbon, you're your carbon-based being. You get finished fixing a bunch of carbon, and then what do you do? You go underground, right? That's why we don't have so much carbon like they have in Venus. On Venus, where it's 800 degrees, our carbon is locked away underground by the process of life and death. Oil is the blood the dead blood of our ancestors, not just our human ancestors, but dinosaurs and all kind of, you know, going back to the beginning of life. Coal, that's the bones. We have built a whole society now on taking all that dead stuff and burning it and taking death out of the ground and putting it up into the sky. That's what we're doing. The reason that Venus is 800 degrees and we're not, most of our carbon is underground. On Venus, that carbon is in the air. We have spent 150 years, it's called the Industrial Revolution, taking that carbon out of the ground and putting it up in the air. That's what in internal combustion engines do. That's what coal-fired power plants do. Takes that death and puts it up, in, and guess what? We're about to reap death from the skies. That's what's happening. So from a spiritual perspective, solar, right? The living sun, wind, right? The living winds, wave, the interaction between the earth and, 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 and the moon, a living interaction, wave power, the living fire beneath our feet, geothermal. From a spiritual perspective, that's the shift. We've got to go from burning the bodies of our ancestors without ceremony in these engines, right, and, 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 and using death to power our society to using the living things, the beautiful things. Now, if you can understand the values of shifting the government to being on the side of the problem solvers and all our beautiful problem solvers who are doing miracles with pennies, you understand the spiritual need to go from living, right, having a living energy system and not a dead one, then we won't get lost and confused as we go through these policy mazes and debates. Because one thing that's happening now is that we have the rise of these, what I call, dirty greens, these strange greens who say, oh, we're for wind, we're for solar, we're for all of the above. We're for all of the above. We want your wind, we want your solar, we also want nuclear. We'll get you some green jobs. You'll be glowing green, right? We want nuclear, right? We want, we want oil shale. We want tar sands. But we want gasified coal. We want all of the above. It's dirty greens. And we have to be very clear. No, 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 no. First of all, if I went to a doctor and I said, doctor, I'm sick, what do you prescribe for me? And the doctor said, all of the above. I fire my doctor. My doctor is not making wise choices. If I went to a, a nutritionist and I said, I'm, I didn't change my life, I want to go on a diet, what should I eat? The doctor says, all the above. I have to fire that nutritionist. If I have a teenage son and says, I'm going out, what I'm doing? I'm going to do all of the above, right? You get a timeout. Uh, all of the above is not a wise way. It's a great sound bite, it's a bad strategy. It's not a wise way to move forward. And so as these strange permutations on green show up, we have to be clear about what we truly stand for. Uh, there's a clean green solution that has the right values, 
that's spiritually consistent, that puts us in a different reality with the earth and with future generations and with ourselves. So we have to have the right policy, the right technology, the right values, the right spiritual perspective, and if we have all those things in good order, we will create the country we've always wanted. My name is Frank Lucantori. I'm a resident of Denver and uh, also work with a nonprofit in D.C. called Co-op America. And, um, and while there's a lot of legislative and political stuff going on, there's a lot of groups that are working on an economic base, and you're, you're, you've been talking a lot about that. And um, one of the tensions that's happening is that, and you spoke about this yesterday, Van, was um, you know the dirty greens, like you were just talking about. And there's, there's more businesses that are positioning themselves and marketing themselves in a way, but at the same, that, that we would take exception to, but also at the same time, they're able to, to deliver a scale that the individual or the small business owner can't. And th there is a tension that you, you, in, in order to create change quicker, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about the authenticity uh, around that issue. I'll, I'll do an easy one. I mean, I'll speak to this very briefly. You, you, yeah, you, you, you've hit the, your, the nail on the head. Um, we want two things that don't go together. Um, we want for the whole society to transform and move in a different direction, but then the minute the big polluters that we always fought start doing it, we say, oh, you're greenwashing, right? And sometimes they are. The challenge that we have is to have a, a consistent standard that we can hold both the little ones, the little companies too, and the big companies and we haven't gotten there yet. Uh, I've gotten the uh, sign here, so uh, again, I wanna thank, uh, first of all, the sponsors. Uh, we we uh, sponsored this tent as well in uh, this program. Uh, this is a great idea. It's what the uh, Democratic Party uh, does stand for. It's a big tent. Sometimes we forget that, but uh, I think it is uh, critical. And uh, clearly a, hand, you know, a tip of the hat to those who are involved in, in blogging and having uh, run the Electronic Industries Alliance, I would tell you I'm a big fan of that as well. Uh, again, uh, Van, thank you so much for uh, your leadership uh, and your uh, eloquent voice, and uh, thank you all for attending, and have a great convention. Thank you, Dave. Dave, doing it the hard way with the automakers. He's, doing, he's, in, there, he's in there with them, bringing out the best in them.